today's videos on 407C. Please follow along with all the other videos so that you can make an evaluation on which refrigerants that might work best for you. 407C was one of the first replacement refrigerants that came out on the market when we first found out we were going to discontinue use. So it's been out for quite some time and thought that it was going to be the only option until some of the other blends. So what I want to talk about is specifically 407C is a three-part blended refrigerant. And out of all the replacements for R22, 407C comes the closest to matching the capacity and efficiency of 407C, but still does not hit the exact capacity and efficiency. In other words, you are going to lose some efficiency and capacity with any of the drop-ins, but this one's going to be the least amount. Um, what I'd like to say with all the drop-ins, and especially even with 407C, is my biggest concern would be if you are already working with R22 units in the middle of summer and you've got residents that are unhappy because of the performance of their present R22 system, it's struggling to keep up with the capacity and efficiency of the dog days of summer, they're coming home, the thermostat is not cycling off or even turning off till 9 or 10 o'clock at night because of the insulation values and the unit's working to its maximum efficiency and you choose to switch that over to any of the drop-ins, whether it's 407C, it's not going to make it better. It's probably going to make it worse. So it means they're going to scream louder and longer, and it's going to run for a longer period of time. But it's not to the concern of, oh my God, it's going to double their electric bill. What it means is, yes, it will increase the amp draw at higher temperatures, and it starts dropping out of efficiency at about 95 degrees. So which increases the head pressure, which makes the compressor work harder to pull more amps, therefore using more electricity. But when you do the numbers, it works out to about three to five dollar increase on a resident's electric bill over the course of a month. So if it satisfies the thermostat, makes the resident happy, I don't think that's going to stop you from using this refrigerant with that little bit of an increase. Uh, with that said, all of them are going to come close, but this one is the closest to matching capacity and efficiency. Some of the, that, that's the pro on using the 407C. Some of the cons are it is a heavy fractionating refrigerant and it's not a drop-in. As I stated in the previous videos, and hopefully we're starting to understand drop-in doesn't mean I drop it in on top of R22. Drop-in means that I pull a refrigerant out, run a vacuum on a system, and reintroduce a new refrigerant and expect it to work. 407C is not one of your drop-ins. 407C is a retrofit replacement. In other words, I have to remove the refrigerant and the existing oil in the R22 system or the older R22 systems to, for it to be compatible. If I put 407C into an older R22 system with the mineral-based oils and the alpha benzene oils that are in the system, Yes, it's going to work in the beginning, but what happens is the refrigerant picks up the oil and it's meniscable with the oil at the higher temperatures. When it hits the evaporator and temperature changes and gets lower, then that cooler temperature drops the oil out of it and starts flooding the evaporator with the oil. The oil, the dry refrigerant returns back to the compressor, picks up more, till eventually it starves the compressor and you end up getting a compressor failure a month, two months down the road and you've got compressors dropping like flies because you're not doing the oil change. That's the reason for the oil change. So when we change the oil, you take the compressor, you cut it out. Get a measuring cup of some sort, pour it in there so that you can measure how much you took out. Once you get it all out, then flush the compressor as well as flush your line sets and flush the evaporator with an approved flush kit to the outside and make sure you catch any residual oil that you're not just spraying it on to the ground for environmental causes. It's your oil, it's your waste, you own it, do not throw it down and make sure you find a place that accepts recycled refrigerant oils. Don't just throw it in with other oils, it can't be mixed with any other oils. But when we go to use this, if we're doing just a compressor change, the good news is, is all the new compressors have the POE oils in it. 
So it'll require a light flush on the system, the evaporator, flush those line sets, hook up your new one. You can put 407C into that without doing any extensive oil changes because the new compressor has the oil change. It is, when I said it's a heavy fractionate, it's a three-part blend. It has three pieces to the blend that are mixed in different percentages. And for the most part, anytime you mix any of the refrigerants together, they make either a zeotrope or an azeotropic mixture. An azeotropic mixture would be like if you mixed water over coffee grounds, you get black coffee, that's an azeotropic mixture. It's not water anymore, it's not coffee grounds. If I leave it sitting out, it still stays coffee, it just got cold. <coughs> On the other token though, this is a zeotrope mixture. In other words, if I take chocolate and I take milk and I mix it together, I have chocolate milk, but if I leave it sit for an hour or two, what has a tendency to happen is the chocolate starts to settle out of it and it's heavier than that and the portions of the blend start to separate. So if I look at 407C and I can take this and put it in a glass jug and dye each part of the blend different colors, you'd see three separate colors at the top of this jug and the portion of the blend with the highest vapor pressure would be at the top. If I opened it up in a vapor phase, what would come out is the portion of the blend with the highest vapor pressure, more of it would come out than the other portions. So anytime we use any of the blends, it's always said to charge in as a liquid. Charge liquid only at the other end with this end up. So we're gonna invert the jug to charge that in. Now, if the liquid refrigerant goes in, I'm getting equal portions of the constitutes of each portion of the blend in the percentages that it's rated for to work properly in that system. With that being said though, we can't, because we have portions of the blend that start to evaporate in the evaporator. And some of the portions of the blend are gonna vaporize and turn to vapor before other portions. So we have this big window of what they call a dew point when 100% of the portions of the blend have vaporized. And you have a bubble point where 100% of the portions of the blend are liquid. But in between, each one starts their phase change in between each one. So when we charge this in, we want to do it to dew point or bubble point. So if we're vapor charging and we have a fixed piston, we're instructed to use superheat. When we use superheat, we're going to use the dew point values. In most cases, you have a pressure temperature chart that comes with the refrigerant or on the bottom of the box so that you can read that dew point and bubble point when the jug is in the correct position so that you can look for your 40 degree evaporator. And if we look for 407C with a 40 degree evaporator, we're looking at about 63 pressure, so it's slightly lower than what you're used to seeing. So when we charge that up, we get to our 63 pressure. Now we're gonna measure the temperature on our suction gauge now we have our pressure gauge converted over to there, and the difference between those two numbers is going to tell you the superheat, depending on the outdoor temperature and the indoor temperatures using wet bulb or dry bulb to come up with the proper superheat. But just remember, if you're using superheat, you're instructed to use the dew point values. The best way to remember that is super duper get you to superheat. The other one is subcooling if you have a TXV and you're going to take the temperature off the liquid line and then you're going to look at your bubble point values on the other side of the chart. With that said, this refrigerant has a lot of advantages in a lot of different markets. The biggest advantage I see is if you had 30 ton package units like a Walmart. All Walmarts have decided when they retrofit a system they want to switch to 407C. But again, you're talking about a 30 ton package unit in a controlled environment where you can actually drain the compressor. In our market, it's not so easy to drain the compressor of the oil. They don't have oil plugs on it. Your 30 ton package units will, and it makes it a little bit simpler to do the oil changes. And besides that, if the compressor goes out in a 30 ton package unit, you just replace one of the compressors because it's got four in it. So it's a lot more feasible for them to just change out a compressor. In our market, it may be so labor intensive that if you're not changing compressors, it might not be the way you want to go. But you may have a company that has dictated to you to 407C. Just remember that if you do a compressor change out, the new compressors will have the oil. No extensive oil flushing will be required except for the line set. So you'll flush the line set, 
run a vacuum on the system, change the dryers, and introduce the new refrigerant with no other refrigerant in the system. Next, we'll talk about the other refrigerants in the other videos to follow.